So, 902, good morning everybody and welcome from northern Germany to, to Austria today. So, we're actually uh, hosting the next webinar Wednesday, um, this time um, together with uh, the company PCCL. Um, we have uh, seen today novel polymeric materials for high pressure hydrogen gas environments. So, and we are welcoming today the two speakers, Mr. Vinoy Balazoria and Mr. Florian Wanghofer from the Polymer Competence Center in Leobin. Um, as everybody knows, we are just doing in the beginning the presentation, so please keep your microphones mute and your camera switched off. At the end, we will uh, give the possibilities for question and answers, and then um, I will lead you through this. You can put your questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand and directly address your questions. I wish you a wonderful good morning and uh, hand over to the two speakers, please. Thank you very much. Um, I welcome you also uh, to the presentations. I hope you all hear us very well. Um, yeah, so then um, together with uh, me, Florian Wangufa, uh, he's here. So today we are going to uh, discuss some of our results under the topic of uh, novel polymeric materials for high pressure hydrogen gas environments. So as initially uh, introduced nicely. So this is uh, together with Composites United and also together with uh, PCCL goes uh, digital initiatives or thank you for making this platform. So then we will discuss these results that we got um, under the polymers for hydrogen uh, module project, which is a project for decarbonizing of uh, energy infrastructure using uh, novel polymers. So uh, when we uh, quickly have a look um, over the key figures of this project, this is a, a big project which runs uh, for four years um, with a budget of 3.75 million euros. Um, for this uh, purpose, we are working together with seven uh, scientific partners, as you see here. And also we have uh, five company partners um, for reaching the goals of this uh, project. And in terms of publications, um, we have reached around 14 for so far, and we keep counting this number. And in terms of patents, we have already one, and also that is uh, increasing in the near future. So concerning academic theses, we have some PhD students uh, working for the project, as well as some master's students, as you see here, the numbers. So um, when we discuss more about this uh, whole project, we have mainly three sub-projects. Uh, first one uh, mainly focuses the uh, novel matrix materials and design concepts for high pressure storage vessels. This one um, has key researcher as uh, Shamblas Rogel and Markus Wolfart has our project manager. So today, uh, Florian will show you some results of this uh, sub-project later on. And we have the second project under the topic of new experimental methods and simulation approaches to achieve reliable prediction of the permeation of hydrogen gases through the polymer composites. So for this one, we have Alexander Tapner as the key researcher and Johannes Marker uh, as project manager. Unfortunately, we don't hear anything from this project today, but from the third project, these new approaches and characterization techniques towards reinforced polymers with tailored filler matrix interface for high pressure environments. So there we have Claudia Marano as a key researcher and myself as a project manager. So you will also hear some uh, results from this project as well. So as we uh, discussed, so we have today two sessions. So first one um, I will have under the topic of elastomers in high pressure hydrogen atmospheres, challenges and possible improvement. And later on, Florian will uh, follow with his topic, polymers for hydrogen gas pressure composite vessels. So with that one, uh, we come to the end of the first introduction for the project and today's presentation. So then we can directly uh, start the first presentation, which is coming from me, um, under the topic of glass Thomas in high pressure hydrogen atmosphere 
possible challenges and improvements in these topics. So we are working with uh, many scientific partners as we discussed earlier as well. So in next slides, we will discuss some of the results that from this project. So for this one, we will go through the background and motivation of this topic. And then we will discuss our approach or research approach, uh, uh, getting some of the, the challenges um, addressed. And then we discuss about the experiments and results in terms of RGD performance and the characterization for materials that we developed and some hydrogen exposure tests and, and filler modification topics uh, as well. So at the end, I will summarize the work and discuss some of the outlook. So when we consider about the background and the motivation of this topic, um, here you see um, hydrogen gas energy system for mobility. As you know, for, for synthesizing of the hydrogen, uh, we need to have some uh, sources of electricity. So it is better if we make sure that we get some green energy so then that we, our all values are fulfilled. And then we need to store what we synthesize in, in uh, hydrogen storage facilities. Uh, in this case, we focus on hydrogen gas storage conditions. And then we can use them in uh, filling stations or, uh, or stations. And then we can use them in the uh, cars or vehicles in any other applications. FCVs in general, we discuss here as a mobility. So when we consider about this buffer storage, so we um, expect to reach up to 100 megapascal. I know it's a bit high value, but as considering the, the future and near future uh, targets, so we try to develop some uh, materials until 100 megapascal. And then when we consider about the delivery of the hydrogen uh, from synthesizes to buffer storage, so we have several methods like Pipelines, as you see here, they normally work up to 17 megapascal and also through um, tube trailers, so which normally up to 25 megapascal. But when we consider about the vehicle or fuel cell vehicle, then on board storage um, should be around 30 to 70 at the moment. And but when we consider about the actual fuel cell, the gas should go in a very low pressure. So therefore we need to have a lot of components in between to have um, address these all conditions what we need. So what are the working conditions? Mainly we have to deal with uh, cyclic exposure conditions in terms of uh, filling the tanks or here and also in the fuel cell vehicle and also some pressure fluctuations in terms of uh, pipelines or inside the vehicle and also the white temperature ranges, for example, minus 42 plus 85 degrees C. So what are the challenges? That, of course, that always good to have uh, higher pressure conditions so that we have better energy sources uh, for our um, applications. And in terms of fuel cell vehicles, it is a challenge also to have a higher mileage always, so it is always encouraged to have better storage inside and quick refueling time, and also the low weight solutions for mobility applications, especially. So what are the roles of polymeric materials in these conditions? So here you see uh, the main uh, components that you can see that pipelines or piping, there you already know, probably there are some applications with steel pipes and with the polymer liner or only with the uh, fiber reinforced polymer pipelines. In terms of storage vessels, the same. So there are some also the composite shell plus liner and also the new initiative is like the fiber reinforced composite, no liner. Just, so in these cases, we have like also formally grades in these solutions. And in terms of flexible hoses in fueling stations or vehicle fuel systems, we have mostly uh, rubber uh, grades. And in terms of sealing solutions, or some flexible connectors or inside valves. And these things we have always uh, with some elastomers and also some plastic as well. So in this case, what are the challenges of these polymeric materials in, in high pressure gas conditions? So here you see like a practical example of 
um, O-ring of a rubber um, grade. So as you see here, one end is exposed to the high pressure hydrogen gas in, in this case. So as you see here, so one side is exposed to the hydrogen uh, based on this high pressure condition and other side is low pressure. So the main challenge is the leaking. So how this could happen? So like leakage to the grab, as you see here, if we don't choose the right ceiling or ceiling dimensions are, are a bit different and other method would be the leakage through permeation, as you see here. Uh, this can be improved with the barrier properties of the polymer. And the other main leakage mechanism is the damage, uh, physical damage of the ceiling. So this should be improved with the damage modes. So what is the main damage mode here we expect? That is the rapid gas decompression failure. Um, how it happens? So it happens when, for example, the ceiling exposed to the high pressure gas, then this gas goes in and in uh, if the, the outer pressure is suddenly released, then this gas tries to go out in one end and also the gas inside tries to expand itself. So there are a lot of stresses uh, taking place inside the material so that uh, we have also the 3D pneumatic state within the material. So if these stress levels are um, high enough, they initiate the cracks and if they are even higher then they could even propagate to the outer surface. So here you see an example uh, how these cracks could be inside so if it was uh, without the compression these cracks could be just randomly distributed or if it's fresh or stress like in a, a real application then these cracks could align so if these uh, stress levels are even fatal then can go on to the uh, surface of the uh, o-ring so this failure intensity also depends on the material properties so fracture mechanics of the material is very important of course, then the exposure conditions, but we have which gas, pressure, temperature, compression rates and cycles, how many cycles we have, <clears throat> as well as the component design. <clears throat> so what is our approach to um, uh, address these challenges? So here we see uh, from our polymers for hydrogen, we have different um, aspects. Uh, here, for example, we have developed some suitable elastomers. In this case, I show you some HNDR and NDR rates with CD and silica field. And we consider here also the varying the cross-linking strategies, for example, sulfur and peroxide cross-linking for these rubber grades. Then we test them uh, in component level, like a ceiling application to see the applicability of them uh, in these harsh conditions. In terms of characterization of uh, structure uh, property relationships, we have also the test methods developed here. And then uh, to see how materials behaving under high pressure hydrogen. So we have also test up to 100 megapascal and 120 C, uh, degrees C. So further on, uh, considering the permeation and, and transport properties of the material. So we also try to introduce some 2D fillers incorporating some also the serialization steps into the uh, process. So with this uh, approach, I show you some, some of selected materials and, and some selected characterization techniques here. First, a uh, couple of HNBR2 grades, they are both uh, CB field and one is additionally polyamide field one and three NBR grades. So they are two carbon black field and the third one is silica field one. And the first NBR one is a peroxide kiot. The other two are sulfur kiot grades. So in this case, we see how these uh, differences uh, um, affect on our properties. So in this case, we show some basic characterizations and fracture and fatigue properties and RGT performance, as well as hydrogen exposure. Yes, you see some of the specimens that we use um, in general. And this is like a O-ring uh, what we use for uh, component level RGD resistance. So here you see the basic characterization of, of all these fibrates or stress strain curves. Um, if I briefly explain that HNBR, two grades are showing with uh, stiffer material behavior, also together with NBR1, which is peroxide kiot, and the sulfur kiot ones show a bit softer behavior compared to the other two, the three, sorry. 
and the silica field one even softer and more toughening behavior. So further in terms of, of uh, show a hardness, which is very important for RGD, especially considering the gas uh, intake. So they are all in the good uh, range around 80 uh, show a hardness. Um, other important property would be glass transition temperature. Here we discuss uh, the applications up to minus 40. So therefore it is very important. This GG value is also reaching the same values because then we can expect the ceilings are having low temperature flexibility. So in this case, uh, 3HNBR grades having an edge uh, over the HNBR grades. So here I can show you some of the rapid gas decompression uh, test results and component level. Here we uh, test them according to the NOSOC standard. Uh, so according to the standard, we have a CO2 CH4 mix and a pressure of 150 bar and a decompression rate of 20 bar per minute and exposures of eight cycles at a temperature of 100 degrees C. So here you see after the decompression, uh, the cross sections of a ceiling. And there you can see this from the microscope pictures and you can clearly see some uh, cracks. And this, this is like the unconstrained condition measurement. So which means the ceiling is lying on the, on the inside the autoclave, but without um, uh, pressure or constraint as a similar to ceiling application. So here you see these numbers, these are rankings based on the number of cracks. So this number we come up with this um, ranking method that we get from the NOSOC standard. So where zero is the best, where we don't see any crack or blisters and five is the worst based on number of cracks and the fatality of the crack. So in terms of that, so four or above, um, in a constrained condition, the ceiling is fake. But here, as we're discussing in unconstrained, so uh, this could be still good as they didn't show any cracks in the constrained condition. So anyway, here I show these numbers to show you how they differ each other. So in the next one, you can see the another HNBR grade with this PA field additionally uh, to this carbon black which shows slightly better and considering NBR grade, which is peroxide better than other two and considering the NBR2, which is carbon black field and sulfur kiot, that one is the best among them. And this is the silica field grade, which is also quite good that we don't have any number fours and quite good compared to also the other CD field grade. So, as I mentioned before, so there are no cracks in constraint conditions. So that means these are these grades are quite good for high pressure gas conditions anyway, but here as for our purposes that we can see some cracks as you see here uh, on the surfaces of the cross sections. So further, we um, tested these material grades uh, for fraction mechanical properties as you see here. So here we wanted to um, adapt our knowledge in the classical fracture mechanics into this impact like loading conditions because we want to uh, get some more information about materials, how it behaves in really high uh, strain rates so that we expect in RGD like phenomenon. So in this case, we wanted to reach like a one meters per second. So therefore we use this servo hydraulic testing machine to have this high speed test and we use this SCNT specimen, as you see here, the notch, and we have the light system <coughs> and the high-speed cameras for detecting the uh, notch or crack propagation. So as you uh, may know, so then based on the fracture mechanics for SCNT, we can uh, calculate the stored strain energy for SCNT. Uh, according to this equation. And here I don't show you, or I don't want to bore, uh, bore you with more additional steps. Here I show you only um, overview here. So then we can generate these curves like force displacement curve. Then we can get this uh, behavior and also the G deviation along the displacement 
as you see here. So here we have the possibility to look uh, on the side of the specimen. So there we can uh, see how the crack propagation along the displacement. So we have the luxury here also to calculate the G value along the whole displacement and then take values where it is more important. So in this case, we see that uh, the material has a catastrophic failure and the G value here is interesting. So, but in our previous um, studies, we also uh, try to find the crack initiation value here, but today I, I don't want to show, but if someone is interested, we can discuss them later. And then based on this G max value, we can see how these different materials behave in terms of NBR2 grade. So it has the highest G max and the NBR3 has the intermediate level of G max. So this ranking is in the quite same um, way as we observed in the RGD performance, or in this case that we can directly also correlate if the materials are in the same range uh, based on these G max values, or otherwise we can uh, use them in our modeling and simulation purposes to predict the crack propagation or crack initiation in RGD-like phenomenon. So when we go further on the fracture mechanics topics, or we wanted to also uh, see how the material behaves in like in a cyclic loading condition so that we expect these ceilings or, or flexible hoses, um, they have to go through several exposure cycles so that we can uh, use same kind of um, loads and, and, and uh, conditions to see how the material is getting weaker. So the static is the best method to see this um, phenomenon. So here we develop this method, method to see the crack loss approach and taking a pre-existing crack and to see the, how it takes for the, the failure of the specimen. So then we can generate the data to calculate the service life of such a grade. So here we use also the tiering energy method based on the fracture mechanics and using this Paris air cone approach, as you see here. So this is the specimen we use, this pure shear specimen with a two side notch, as you may see. So this is the method we developed here so that we can use this pure shear specimen, as you see here, and with the IR sensor to detect the temperature increase uh, in case, and also the cameras to detect the crack propagation and also the other software to detect strain and force values what we need for calculation. Um, here you see the brief overview of the, the test method or, or parameters what we use, a uh, certain frequency we use, and then we having uh, cyclic loadings in different steps that we increase every after every 5,000 cycles. So every step provides um, tiering energy value so that we can generate the uh, Paris plot based on this result. And we are always in the tension mode in this cyclic loading. Here also I show only the overview. If someone is interested, we can discuss the also uh, at the end. So based on these results, so then we can plot the Paris plot, which is tearing energy versus crack growth rate. Then we can generate these data plots. This one dot is, is many uh, measurements and as an average so that we get these lines and based on lines that we can um, predict how the service life uh, would be and what which material is better for slow crack propagations or in this case silica's uh, field grade with sulfur cured one has the better material properties and the CB uh, filled with peroxide cured grade has the lowest so uh, in terms of this and based on these um, parameters we can also use for simulation and modeling purposes uh, later on. So then um, we come to the hydrogen exposure test and then observations what we uh, got based on these measurements. So first I show only like two grades which, which, is like, which are like HNBR1 and HNBR2, CB field and CB plus PA field ones. So here we expose them up to 100 megapascal, 120 Celsius, and uh, two different conditions like seven days or 21 days, but the decompression was quite fast and uh, less than five seconds. So then the measurements were taken place um, like right after decompression and after 48 hours 
of the measurement. So then we expect the gas is fully dissolved. So here are the specimens what we normally exposed and this autoclaves we uh, use there. Um, first of all, I show you how it looked like just after the compression that we could also see some blisters as you see here. Uh, that was quite good observation because with H2 that um, we expect the, the molecule is quite small and that they could go out also the specimen easily. But in this case, we see also the <clears throat> these blisters uh, right after decompression. That was a good observation. And considering uh, the weight and volume, so we could see that the right after decompression, this uh, weight and volume values were increased. This like uh, showing gas solubility inside the material, but after fully gas dissolved state, that we could see even slightly lower uh, values for them compared to the virgin grade. So exposure time didn't influence much, as probably they were already saturated at seven days. And in terms of these two grades, what we compare here, we could see some differences, but that is based on the polyamide, but we use there for another purpose. So considering the hydrogen exposure and material property degradations, here you see that stress at break and elongation at break from a tensile test for these HNBR1 and 2 that we could clearly see that exposed grade showed um, inferior material properties or like uh, st stress at break and elongation at break. So we suspect this is due to the micro cracks inside the material. And in terms of fully gas dissolved state, here you see uh, the DMA results for uh, one of these grades, HNBR1, that we could clearly see that the materials got hardened. Uh, as you see here for the um, storage modulus curve and also the tension delta curve that also this loss, um, this uh, peak getting uh, narrower. So that means that material is getting harder here as well. So less damp. So then we wanted to also see if there are some chemically uh, change uh, stuff in the material so that before and after exposure, we could see clearly some um, changes in these peaks and that so far, we came to conclusion that could be uh, due to some phase separations, but we expected uh, as a result of high pressure ex gas exposure. So some additives are aggregated together and some also uh, additives are migrated out of the specimen so that we could see some changes in the concentration. So if we uh, further consider about the development of these uh, grades, even to a next level so that uh, we try to introduce these two D fillers and then also together with the filler modification. So here we want to um, have a two D filler like this arranged. So then if the diffusion direction is like this, so then we have a torches path for the gas to go through. So with that one, we expect um, a lower gas leakage and a smaller amount of gas inside the material. So these are very important for our GD performance and free volume of the material and uh, changing of the material properties afterwards. So um, as I mentioned, so in this case, we consider it's graphene oxide um, or hetero uh, boronite right grade. So, but the main problem here that we need to uh, exfoliate such 2D fillers uh, to get uh, layers out of these stacks. So then we need to exfoliate them first and then do surface activations and some treatments in between based on different grades. And then finally we can apply the silane coupling agent. So then we can expect better filter rubber interaction and filter distribution uh, inside the material. So here I show you some um, results, but uh, only uh, basic results here to show how this uh, functionalization worked based on the FTIR. So this um, here you see that um, for the boronitride gate that we should expect some serenization peaks here, but uh, in this case we didn't see much. But in terms of graphene oxide, we could observe clearly the increase of serenization uh, peaks here. So that means that better uh, material properties or material 
better serenization with the graphene oxide. So then we go on and then we are now in the phase of incorporating them into the matrices uh, and we expecting good results for this. So that uh, brings me to the summary of this uh, work. So here I wanted to show some of the overview of our results. So mainly that you uh, so that polymeric materials play quite a good role here in the hydrogen exposure conditions and these atmospheres. But the challenge is to reach really high pressures and working at really a uh, wide range of temperatures in the cycle drops. So also we observe that a GD phenomena is also here taking part, but how significant in hydrogen conditions. So we are uh, doing this further characterization for that. And also we saw some property changes after exposure and how fatal or how um, bad is these differences and if there are some uh, chemical degradations here, that's also uh, some parts that we are uh, considering now. And in terms of fracture mechanics, so we developed some uh, methods and try to predict the GT failure and long-term performance. And in terms of another material development, so we I uh, used some 2D fillers, it were quite successfully uh, silanized. So that brings the end to my presentation. Um, I think we discussed the questions later on, so then I can hand over to Florian. Thank you very much. So coming from the rubbers, um, we will now come more to the side of thermoplastics and thermostats. So the part two of uh, the second part, so my presentation is um, about the development of polymers for hydrogen gas pressure vessels. Um, as already mentioned, uh, I'm working in the sub project one of the polymer hydrogen project. Uh, project. And here um, we are working on, um, working together with uh, Tampere University and TU Munich as well as the company partners Faresia and Peak Technology. So we at PCCL um, working on the new polymer synthesis and the characterization of those um, newly developed polymers, um, while our partners at Tampere and, TU, um, and, and in Munich um, are working on um, fillers and fiber func functionalization and um, in Munich uh, for the optimizing and developing new processes to produce those uh, pressure vessels. Uh, we can we are all working on those uh, projects in parallel, but of course it is uh, planned that in the end we will then combine all our results and yeah, uh, produce the demonstrator there. So for the um, development of the materials, uh, we are focusing uh, on the one hand on novel liner materials for type 4 pressure vessels. So the type 4 pressure vessel is depicted on the right, uh, on the upper right here. And it consists of a thermoplastic liner, which uh, provides the gas barrier to the uh, vessel. And then it has a composite overwrap, which then takes up the mechanical and also, of course, the thermal load and provides the stability to the system. So here the goal for us is to um, produce new thermoplastics um, with uh, improved barrier properties. Um, and we are doing that by polymerizing um, some monomers that we synthesized ourselves. And then, uh, of course, uh, we are characterizing the um, influence of the, uh, well, the chemical structure on the permeability and the uh, thermal properties. And the second part is the development of matrix, matrix materials for um, type four, five pressure vessels. So the type five pressure vessels um, do not have this liner, uh, this thermoplastic liner as the gas barrier inside. So the composite um, not only has to carry the load, but it also has um, to act as the gas barrier. So for that, we of course need a matrix material that can withstand those harsh conditions for um, the whole lifetime. Um, and here we are trying to synthesize and characterize new resins and um, yeah, um, with this up and after after we develop those resins, we want to um, get in the laboratory, we want to upscale it and also produce the laminates and of course this demonstrator that I mentioned before. Um, so for the 
conditions that we um, agreed on with our company partners, the operating, operating pressure of those um, pressure vessels is 70 megapascal, and the service temperature, yeah, as, as Vinod already mentioned, is um, between minus 40 degrees Celsius and something like plus 85 degrees Celsius. Um, here for us, um, and so the key material properties for us, for those pressure vessels, are of course um, somewhat of a balancing act because on the one hand the material um, needs a high toughness but on the other hand we also want the low perme permeation and also a high glass transition temperature and high strength of the material um, yeah but the toughness usually comes more with softer materials while the um, other properties are um, usually um, more with uh, harder materials so here we have to find a balance, but the toughness is a crucial parameter because you, um, during the loading, uh, uh, the uh, fill, uh, filling of the tank and the, the pressure just um, changes all the time and this induces a cyclic load to the, um, to the pressure vessel, which um, and also the temperature increases during um, the filling and and unfilling and um, and yeah, so that we have thermal and mechanical um, cyclic loads, and those could induce uh, micro cracks, but of, which can of course also occur during the curing process, and um, as you can imagine, um, cracks in the matrix would result, of course, in an increased permeation. So I will start with the first part, so the development of the liner materials of those type four pressure vessels. Um, yeah, the, our approach here is um, to use so-called ionines as, uh, as the thermoplastic uh, material. And those are polymers with ionic groups uh, in the backbone. And there is a schematic um, depiction on the lower right. So the difference between ionines and polyelectrolytes is <clears throat> in general that um, the ionines have the ions directly in the backbone, while the polyelectrolytes usually um, have it uh, in the side groups here. And um, there would be uh, another term that you might also know is ionomers, and they um, are also ionic polymers, of course, but they have um, a rather low concentration of the ions directly in the structure. Uh, in literature, those ionines are usually used for gas separation um, because the ions um, improve the solubility of CO2 gas and it has a good selectivity towards those. Um, yeah, but um, there are some, uh, there are reports of those ionines and they have very low gas permeability, even though they, of course, for those membranes, try to increase this permeability. So um, that seemed very promising for us. Um, the approach here is to synthesize uh, melt processable ionines, because as I said, in literature, they are use, usually using it for membranes, and they are mostly um, uh, producing the membranes with, via solvent casting, which, of course, is not very suitable for the uh, liner fabrication. And then um, we adapt the properties of those ionines by selecting a corresponding anion. And of course, we change the chemical structure, so the, the linkers, so to say, between those um, ions. For the initial development, we chose some um, parameters that are um, what that we can measure fast. Um, and that would be the first one is that the glass transition temperature needs to be above 120 degrees Celsius for a, um, let's say, uh, amorphous polymer. Um, in case of a crystalline polymer, it would um, apply to the um, melting temperature then. That's just mainly because um, this uh, liner also acts as the mandrel for the filament winding of the pressure vessels. And it needs to be, of course, um, dimensionally stable during the curing of the um, composite overwrap. Then um, very important, of course, is also that the um, Material is melt processable, as I already said. Um, otherwise, we cannot manufacture those liner, uh, those uh, liner materials, uh, those liners. 
And uh, the material also needs to be water insoluble because the um, leakage tests of those um, pressure vessels are, is usually done with water. And yeah, and we can have the water, if the liner then dissolves, then okay, rather bad. Um, so here, just a very short uh, overview of the general synthesis, um, how we um, create those um, monomers. Um, so all those polymers, they, it is basically can div divide it in two steps. So you synthesize a monomer, or um, some would also be uh, commercially available. Um, here, as the example with a nitrogen um, atom. Um, so you, you let this nitrogen atom react with some dehalide, and here you can choose basically any um, groups you want. So it gives you a lot of freedom in the um, for the structure of the polymer, and you create this monomer with two tertiary amines, which can then, in the next step, um, be polymerized with a different or the same um, dehalide, and. In this process, uh, the amine gets quaternized, so ionically um, charged, it has a positive charge. Um, and initially, it gets the halide of, of this um, co-monomer here. And this, um, yeah, this anion you can then just exchange by adding a salt with the desired anion that you would like to choose. So um, the first, um, Polymer that we synthesized here was uh, fully aliphatic, so similar to, let's say, polyethylene um, in the um, chemical structure. So, so it is only um, linear um, chains. Um, and then we exchange the anion just to um, uh, get an insight into the, um, well, the, the influence on the thermal properties. And on you can see here the thermogravimetric analysis and the differential scanning calorimetry. And you can um, obviously see that there is a very um, significant impact on um, the thermal stability, on the glass transition temperature, and also on the hygroscopicity. So here you can see the initial mass loss, which um, um, can be um, attributed to uh, water loss. So for, from those results, I mean, I'm not going into detail for all the different anions, um, but we needed to find one that combines, um, well, low, um, the, the, the properties the best. So we chose this tetrafluoroborate anion here in blue, because it, on the one hand, it provides a very good thermal stability um, with um, rather low hygroscopicity. So there's a rather low um, what, mass loss for water, but it also um, does not decrease um, the, the glass intuition temperature as, for example, the um, bistro trifluoromethane sulfonamide um, anion, which is the one in green, which provide, would provide the highest thermal stability and the lowest hygroscopicity, but however, um, as you can see, it has a TG of a roughly minus 30, so it's of course not suitable. Um, well, in general, you can also see that um, all the glass transition temperatures for this polymer um, are too low. So um, of course we had then to uh, alter the chemical structure of the polymer itself. Um, and that is why um, we then synthesized an, uh, an ionine that is based on amide uh, linkages. Um, and this, M, M, as this polyamide, we then um, also once again altered by increasing and decreasing the um, content of aromatic groups in the polymer. And on the right, you can see the differential scanning calorimetry of those um, polymers before and after the anion exchange. So once again, we can see when we, when we exchange the anion to this tetrafluoroborate um, that there is less um, residual water inside. So those polymers are not uh, measured directly after drying, but after uh, exposure to atmosphere and also after, directly after the synthesis. Um, and yeah, as, as you probably know, that this polymer amide is uh, somewhat susceptible to um, water uptake. However, um, from those results, we could see um, 
that yes, um, as expected, uh, if you decrease the aromatic content, also the TG decreases, so for polymer 2 here in blue. And the increase in um, aromatic content, interestingly, did not increase the TG before the um, anion exchange, but it uh, increased the TG after the anion exchange. And here you can see there's almost no difference between um, those two. However, this, um, before the anion exchange, the polymer is completely water soluble and afterwards um, it is not soluble in water anymore. Um, so we then chose this polymer free with the tetrafluorobrate anion for the further characterization. Um, of course, for, the, for this characterization, we first need to prepare um, uh, samples. Um, so we um, tested uh, some different parameters and we're using a hot press for that. So that's basically just two hot plates on both sides that apply pressure um, and then um, we'll press the polymer into a certain form. Um, yeah, because we have, um, cannot use um, classical injection molding or something like that um, since the polymer is synthesized in our labs. Um, it's a bit limited in material quantity. Um, and on the right, you can see a picture of that. So after the synthesis, it looks like this uh, big sponge, which comes from drying it in the oven. Um, so the water then, when it evaporates, just expands. Um, this then, we then um, all pressed a bit already in the oven and um, crushed it into smaller pieces. And after that, we uh, placed it in this vacuum hot press. On the left hand, you can see it for uh, 260 degrees Celsius. And on the right hand, it would, was for 250 degrees Celsius. Here you can see some unmelted pieces. Um, it would also work for 250 degrees Celsius, but it would lead a longer duration. Um, so the next steps for us here um, in, for the thermoplastic ionines is that we want to prepare um, samples for the thermomechanical, so DMA tests, and of course, mechanical characterization. And at the same time, we also uh, want to perform um, permeability measurements in a measurement cell that is produced uh, or that was developed in the subproject two of uh, polymers for hydrogen project. And um, as a last step, of course, we need to assess the long-term stability of those um, ionines in terms of, of course, again, uh, let's say cracks, and also if you, um, uh, you for the exposure to those um, conditions, so the hydrogen gas under high pressure. So this leads me to the um, second part of my work, um, which is the development of matrix materials for type five uh, uh, gas pressure vessels. So as I said before, there will be no liner. So the matrix, uh, so the composite has to uh, also um, be the gas barrier. Um, and for this, our main concept is once again based on ionic groups, and it is based on, and we are using so-called ion, ionic liquids, and the, which are being uh, functionalized and to build a thermosetting resin and a um, cross-linked uh, material. So those ionic liquids are salts that have a melting temperature below 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and we are using so-called room temperature ionic liquids, which then have a melting temperature below room temperature. So um, it is, well, very similar to a regular resin in terms of processing. Um, the idea behind those uh, ionic groups for us is that the permeability is the product of the diffusivity and the solubility. And um, we uh, were expecting some additional intermolecular bonds due to those uh, ionic groups. So between those ions and uh, also maybe between, uh, so for hydrogen bonding. Um, here you can see a schematic depiction of the idea. So this is the ionic liquid, functionalized with epoxy groups and then cured with a M in Ardena leading to this um, cross-linked network. So the approach here is to um, synthesize, of course, those um, epoxy functional ionic liquids and cross-link them. And then once again, we want, we of course need to tailor the properties through the chemical structure, the anion and the hardener. 
Uh, unfortunately, I, I have to once again do a little excursion into the chemistry um, for the synthesis of those resins. Um, usually there are, well, I would say there are two main um, pathways to produce uh, epoxy resins, or most used. The first one um, is with epichlorohydrin. That is also used for the well, uh, most popular, uh, most common resin, which is the bisphenol A based, based resin. Um, so you just use, um, let it react with this epichlorohydrin, and in this case, um, it, it then, in the same step, photonizes it, and you come out with those um, uh, epoxy groups on the side. Of course, you could also pre-react this with something else to get more, um, well, different side groups. Okay. Um, but yeah, this would be the easiest step. Um, the second pathway is to um, uh, uh, functionalize it with double bonds. And afterwards, um, you can uh, oxidize those double bonds to uh, epoxy groups and um, yeah, then exchange the anion. And this gives you a lot of freedom um, in terms of the chemical structure and also does not include this well, very toxic um, epichlorohydrin. On the right, you can see examples of um, cations and anions. And with all those um, combinations, there is a really um, vast um, diversity in what uh, chemical structures you could use. So here um, with, with our first synthesized um, epoxy ionic liquid, uh, we did a comparison of, di of different hardeners. Um, so um, aliphatic alamine, Alicyclic um, and amine and aromatic amine, and also one uh, anhydrate hardener. On the right, you can see that we uh, once again reach very good uh, thermal stabilities in the thermogravimatic analysis. And in the dynamic mechanical analysis, um, we wanted to use um, to, uh, mainly see our goal of the TG, for, which would be uh, 100 degrees Celsius for the onset temperature. Um, which, yeah, you can see that we are slightly below this, um, even for the aromatic amine and the anhydrate hardener. So we had to change the resin a bit. To this end, we, um, well, you can see here two more um, resins, L2 and L3. So internally, of course, the number is a lot higher, but those are um, the most promising resins. Um, for IL-2, um, we increased the aromatic amount of aromatic groups in the resin itself, in the cation. And for IL-3, we exchanged uh, the anion to a smaller anion. And as you can see on both this um, dynamic me mechanical analysis and also for the permeability measurements over TG, um, you can see that the anion has a very um, significant impact on the um, both uh, permeability and also glass transition temperature. And here we reach a very high modulus and very high uh, glass transition temperature with this um, anhydrate hardener. Um, however, as you can also see those from those literature values, all the systems are within like the same common materials for um, um, liners. So the outlook here um, with the, is the next step is the toughness evaluation of the resins with single edge notch bending tests. Um, this is actually already um, ongoing or um, almost finished and I can say that the results look promising. And um, we also chose um, a resin already to, for the upscaling and we are going to, let, um, to do a custom synthesis in uh, the kilogram scale. Um, then, of course, as I said, with Tampere University, we will um, then implement, try to implement fillers. Um, then the, the next steps will be the production of the laminates. And of course, we need to um, characterize those composites. And as a last step, so to say, of the project, it would, is the goal to uh, produce a demonstrator in cooperation with the Technical University of Munich. This brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, of course, we want to give, uh, we want to ask our funding, uh, thank our funding and all the project partners again. And of course, Composite United to give us uh, this platform. And we are open for questions.